By 1989, the holy warriors who helped Afghanistan drive out the Soviet Union are embracing new causes. Osama bin Laden returns to his home in Saudi Arabia and uses his stature as a war hero to rally Islamic militants throughout the world. In Afghanistan, Mullah Muhammad Omar resumes his religious studies in a madrasa in Kandahar. Meanwhile, other prominent Afghan war veterans vie for political control of the new Afghanistan. Rival Mujahideen factions were united as long as they were fighting the Soviets. But now, the factions splinter and rush toward the capital of Kabul, each hoping to seize power for themselves. When we came to Kabul, Mujahideen became involved in fighting among themselves. The Mujahideen leaders can't agree to form a new government. Each commander wants to govern his own territory autonomously. Eventually, they turn their guns on each other, and Afghanistan erupts into full-fledged civil war. The Mujahideen trade devastating rocket attacks in Kabul, Afghanistan's most densely populated city. This young Afghan boy remembers the day a stray piece of ordnance changed his life forever. When I was eight, a rocket hit our house. I was injured. Some days later, I found out that my brother was killed. Mujahideen fighting kills almost 10,000 Afghan civilians in 1993. As the civil war continues, America's Afghan embassy remains closed, a powerful symbol of waning U.S. interest. Afghans became very disappointed when we saw that uh, those friends that they were sting, sending us money, stingers, all those sophisticated weapons, they stopped. Even they stopped humanitarian assistance to Afghans. Washington lost interest. They simply no longer considered that a big deal. By 1994, the violence in Kabul has spread through the rest of the country, where no government means no law and order. Organized crime fills the security void, and Afghanistan becomes a leading global exporter of heroin. Opium poppies are easily grown here and easily smuggled out across the lawless Pakistani border. This black market for weapons also flourishes. The most powerful of the Mujahideen commanders use their military networks to control this lucrative guns and drugs business. These former war heroes now stake out turf like glorified street thugs. Afghanistan was divided into five different power centers. The Afghans at that time used to say that you need five visas to travel within the country. In the areas under their control, these Mujahideen warlords take whatever they want with no repercussions. Bribes, property, and land. Mullah Zaif recalls how helpless he felt watching the local commander abuse people at will. This was a very, very bad situation. And all the people, they were seeking for someone to rise and to fight with these people and to bring uh, security uh, to Afghanistan. Afghan anger reaches a breaking point when a local Mujahideen commander in Kandahar kidnaps two teenage girls. At the commander's military camp, the girls are repeatedly raped. Looking for justice, the villagers of Zinazgar province turn to the local mullah, a one-eyed veteran of the Afghan-Soviet war, Mohammed Omar. Omar has never been a man to run from responsibility. At a young age, he lost his father and had to learn to provide for his peasant family. Omar spent his teenage years wandering from village to village, offering religious instruction in exchange for shelter and food. When the war with the Soviets came, Omar answered the call. His courage in battle was legendary. Now, Omar only wants to quietly return to his Islamic studies. But when the local commander dishonors these two girls and their families, the one-eyed mullah is ready to stand up and fight. Omar enlists the help of 30 Islamic students, the Taliban. 
I will tell you why I was joined with the Taliban. We have responsibility to protect the people and to protect the area. Armed with just 16 rifles, Mullah Omar leads his vigilante group in an attack on the warlord's base. They commandeered a tank and ran over at least the bottom extremities of this warlord. After freeing the girls, Omar and his followers hang the commander's dead body from the barrel of the tank. That is what the beginning of Taliban. This was the chosen of Mullah Muhammad Omar. Soon after, Mullah Omar has a vision. Well, the Holy Prophet Muhammad coming into his dreams and telling him to pick up the gun and fight the Mujahideen and that he's going to establish his rule all over the country. In the months ahead, the Taliban will make Omar's dreams a reality. It's the early 1990s, and Afghanistan is a failed state riddled with drugs, rampant crime, and warlordism. But stories circulate about a one-eyed mullah bringing hope to the people of Kandahar. Mohammed Omar never asked to lead the Taliban movement. He believes he was simply chosen by God. Omar has a series of mystical visions that convince him to stand up and fight the Mujahideen responsible for Afghanistan's ruinous civil war. Omar's rise from local mullah to national prominence happens almost overnight, according to a rare few who know the Taliban leader. Nobody could imagine that, that this unknown fellow, poor fellow, he didn't have even a proper home. How come this person is going to defeat the Mujahideen who were armed with tanks and aircraft? At the beginning, he had only two or three followers. After 10 days, the, the number of people became thousands and thousands. They were coming and joining with him. The people, the Taliban choosing him because he was a trustful person. Omar's appeal is not his military or political prowess, but his deep piety. He believed that he was working at the end of time, that he was entirely in service of God as he understood God and that his efforts to build a perfect Islamic state were in part an effort to secure his passage to heaven. Omar is a reclusive figure who seldom ventures outside his home in Kandahar. He has never met with any Western journalist or diplomat. To this day, it's hard to separate Omar, the man, from all the myths and legends that surround him. Those who know him describe Omar as quiet and shy despite being an imposing physical presence. Because he deeply distrusts modern technology and is against all reproductions of the human form, there are few photographs of Omar in existence. He refused to be photographed for Islamic reasons. He said, cannot take pictures of human beings or living creatures. He is a rural religious figure whose beliefs are quite narrow and uh, fundamental. Even today, many of Omar's fundamental beliefs are still the norm in southern Afghanistan. A rudimentary religious education is all that's available to many children in the area. Omar recruits his growing legion of followers from Islamic schools like this one. Young boys like these Taliban study the teachings of an 18th century desert preacher named Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Wahab believed that all forms of adornment and modernity were blasphemous. He preached that every enemy of Allah should be converted or destroyed. According to one story, when Wahab came across a woman accused of fornication, he ordered her stoned to death. This severe doctrine stands in contrast to many of the rich cultural traditions of previous and current Islamic civilizations. But Wahhabism was strongly promoted by the Saudi religious clergy. And it was Saudi Arabia that donated most of the textbooks and learning materials to the Taliban. A holy war fought in Wahhab's name helped give birth to modern Saudi Arabia. Now, a new jihad will lead to the violent rise of the Taliban. The Taliban movement has simple aims, to restore peace, disarm the population, and implement strict Islamic law. Omar's followers wear long beards, 
dark eyeliner, and distinctive black turbans to signify their religious commitment. On November 3rd, 1994, this growing Taliban force moves on Kandahar. After just two days of fighting, Mullah Omar's followers capture the second largest city in Afghanistan, and at a cost of only a dozen men. They rise up at that moment and take over. They captured Kandahar almost without a fight. How did Omar's relatively unknown force capture an entire city without a major battle? Rumors circulate that the Pakistani Intelligence Service, or ISI, has bribed the local commander in Kandahar to surrender. After Pakistani Interior Minister Nazirullah Babar calls the Taliban our boys, suspicion grows that Omar's troops are backed by Pakistan. But two former ISI leaders deny the charges. The interior minister started saying, these are my boys and all that. But the reality is, no, not at all. It's wrong to say that Pakistan created Taliban. Absolutely not. The Taliban is a phenomenon by itself. You can say peculiar to a foreign society. Other observers say that even if the ISI didn't create the Taliban, Pakistan was instrumental in Omar's rise. And I don't think Pakistan had a role in trying to raise the Taliban army initially. When Pakistan came to realize that Taliban are a growing force, they offered them food and fuel and supplies. The ISI helps Mullah Omar's troops repair huge stockpiles of sophisticated Soviet weaponry left behind in the haste of the Red Army's retreat. In Kandahar, the Taliban captured dozens of tanks, stores of weapons, helicopters, and MiG fighter jets. Omar's heavily armed troops now look to conquer more territory. In the next three months, the Taliban seize power in 12 of Afghanistan's 31 provinces. The bloodshed is minimal, as Afghans eager for change in their war-torn country welcome the Taliban as liberators. The Taliban have come as savior of the people. They claimed at the beginning that they will bring peace, stability, and security. They will save the people from those atrocities. So at the beginning, the people supported them. A lot of people give their weapons, and a lot of the provinces, without fighting, they fall into their hands. 20,000 Madrasa students, many of them between 14 and 24 years old, join the Taliban's march through Afghanistan. Wahid Mosdeh was one of the young men who felt the pull of Mullah Omar. I joined the Taliban. I was one of the people who were very interested in learning about the movement. It was really secretive at that time. Mysteries continued to surround the Taliban, Mullah Omar, and Pakistan's role in the rise of the movement. But the Taliban's ambitions are right out in the open. After sweeping through the south, Omar's followers set their sights on Kabul. Just outside the capital city, the Taliban overrun the headquarters of Gubaldin Hekmatyar, one of the two feuding Mujahideen commanders controlling the area. The other, Ahmed Shah Massoud, remains entrenched in Kabul. Raftan, Tanhob. Ahmed Shah Massoud's front blocked the Taliban from getting the entire Afghanistan. Ahmed Shah Massoud will become Mullah Omar's arch nemesis. Massoud is one of the most legendary fighters in Afghan history. He is the son of a colonel in King Zahir Shah's army. Like most Afghans, Massoud was raised as a devout Muslim. But he also grew up with a rare exposure to Western languages and literature. During the war with the Soviet Union, Massoud commanded a small force protecting his birthplace, the Panjir Valley. His use of innovative guerrilla tactics helped the Afghans win countless battles against better trained, better armed Soviet troops. Even today, Massoud is still known here by his nickname, the Lion of the Panjir. But Massoud isn't a hero to all Afghans. When the Soviet war ended, he was one of the Mujahideen leaders who helped plunge the country into civil war. Many Afghans, especially in the South, prefer Mullah Omar and the Taliban. 
But in 1995, Massoud still has strong support in Kabul, the longtime seat of power in Afghanistan. When he sees that the Taliban are determined to capture the capital city, Massoud decides to strike first. His experienced fighters hit the Taliban with a devastating attack. After taking at least 3,000 casualties, Omar's troops are finally forced to retreat from Kabul. It's the Taliban's first major military defeat. This was the biggest setback to the Taliban movement. Stubbornly, Mullah Omar presses on, possessed by the conviction that it is Allah's will he rule Afghanistan. On April 4, 1996 in Kandahar, Omar appears on a balcony above more than 1,200 religious leaders. He wraps himself in a cloak taken out of its shrine for the first time in 60 years. According to legend, this cloak once belonged to the Prophet Muhammad. The cloak confers upon its wearer a ranking in Islam nearly second to the Prophet himself, Amir ul Mu'minin, commander of the faithful. With this lofty title, Mullah Omar assumes the right to lead not just all Afghans, but all Muslims. The Taliban movement is just the beginning of larger ambitions. Radicals like Osama bin Laden believe that Islam itself is on the march. First Afghanistan, then the entire world. In spring of 1996, the Taliban lay siege to Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. Mullah Muhammad Omar's followers pummel the city with more than 866 rockets in the month of April alone. But the forces of Ahmed Shah Massoud repeatedly turn the Taliban back. As the civil war continues to devastate the country, Massoud and Afghan President Burhanuddin Rabbani seek help from an old friend of Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden is living in Sudan, Africa. Here, he organizes other Arab veterans of the Afghan-Soviet war into an early version of Al-Qaeda. But in 1996, the Sudanese government tells bin Laden to find a new base for his terrorist jihad. It was Rabbani and Ahmed Shah Massoud, who's defense minister, who invited him to come back to Afghanistan. He was someone who had worked with the Mujahideen in the past and was respected. They said he should mediate between them and the Taliban so that the war would be over and they would make a joint government. On May 18, 1996, Bin Laden arrives in the eastern Afghan city of Jalalabad. Just months after Bin Laden's arrival, Taliban forces seize Jalalabad. And now Mullah Omar controls Bin Laden's new home. Bin Laden and his Taliban hosts are skeptical of each other at first. When the Taliban came to Jalalabad, he was not good with, with the Taliban in the beginning. Simply, they gave an asylum to him and they told him to stay under the Taliban area and you are against your Mujahid and we are, we are expecting to you to, to be in Afghanistan. This was the relationship between Taliban and Osama. Bin Laden had never met Taliban leader Mullah Omar, but by all accounts, Bin Laden and Omar quickly developed a personal relationship. I think there is a, a mutual respect between the two men based primarily on their, their religious beliefs and the fact that they both have fought and been wounded fighting the enemies of the faith. Former Taliban say bin Laden believes in Mullah Omar's Islamic vision for Afghanistan. Before he was thinking the Taliban, they are not good people. And after that, uh, he confessed that he was not uh, in the right way. And the Taliban, they are the, the right people. They are religious and they are following the way of Islam. Osama joined the Taliban. Exactly how Omar won bin Laden's loyalty is still a mystery. But the future al-Qaeda leader spends $3 million of his own money 
to bribe the last commanders standing between the Taliban and their ultimate goal, Kabul. The Taliban are now backed with money, arms and supplies from bin Laden, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Mullah Omar is about to fulfill his destiny as ruler of a new Islamic emirate of Afghanistan. On September 26, 1996, the Taliban roar into Kabul in pickup trucks with heavy machine guns mounted in their beds. Ahmed Shah Massoud knows he can't repel this overwhelming force. Instead, he decides to retreat with his army and live to fight another day. That night, scores of Taliban troops enter an empty city. Shukriya Baraksai remembers how eerily silent it was in Kabul when the Taliban first arrived. There was a quiet, there was a just few cars was on the streets full of Taliban. When the Taliban was camped to Kabul, at that time I was a pregnant and I was really optimistic. I was believed that, oh, that's the new life. Finally, we got the peace. But soon, just after a few hours, I got to know that I was wrong. A special Taliban hit squad mobilizes within hours of entering Kabul. Their target, Najibullah, the communist leader and former Afghan president. The assassins find Najibullah and his brother in an unguarded United Nations compound. The Taliban torture Najibullah and his brother to death. Omar's followers hang the dead bodies from a traffic light. They stick cigarettes between the corpse's fingers and stuff Afghan money into their pockets to indicate the corruption and debauchery for which the Taliban have sentenced them to death. As Afghans awake the next day to discover these corpses, the message is clear. A violent new power has arrived in Afghanistan. I saw those men, which is, they was against Dr. Najibullah, but they cry for Najibullah. Why this thing, this violence was happened to him? What was his ideology? That's a different point. But what Taliban did, that's really bad. Who was Taliban? Who gave them rights to do that? The Taliban feel they have a divine mandate to govern Afghanistan, according to a very extreme interpretation of Sharia, Muslim religious law. Mullah Omar hopes to return the country to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, an era 1,400 years in the past. Within 24 hours of taking Kabul, Omar's followers imposed the strictest Islamic system in place anywhere in the world. Radio Kabul, renamed Radio Sharia, announces a lengthy list of new Taliban regulations. The new regime bans TV, videos, satellite dishes, music, and all games. The Taliban enforce their laws severely. They punish even petty thieves by amputating their feet and hands. Do you think that's Islam? Of course, no. Do you think that's human can do that? Of course, no. In our Afghan tradition, they never did that. A former official says that the Taliban were just following Mullah Omar's orders. It was the Mullah Omar edict to, to do this. Mullah Omar's edicts are enforced by a government ministry called the Department for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. The ministry's religious police patrol the streets in pickup trucks, flying the white flag. These Taliban are notorious for beating people in broad daylight. Anybody who did not have a beard or the proper size of the beard would be beaten up publicly. You know, I saw it myself. I saw a young doctor was beaten up in Herat. And I asked him after he was beaten up, he said, until today, I was supporting the Taliban. But from now onwards, I'm going to oppose them. Many Afghans who once welcomed the Taliban now recoil as their dark vision for the country becomes a reality. Their ideas were wrong. Their mission was wrong. Their mentality was wrong. All the time, the bad memories is coming with the name of Talib. The Taliban's new regulations severely limit Afghan women's rights. Mullah Omar's edict banning girls from school affects more than 70,000 female students. Omar also decrees that Afghan women cannot work outside their homes 
and must cover themselves in the head-to-toe veil known as the burqa. Burqa is not in our tradition. It's not our religion. Why shall I wear burqa? Why they punish me? Why they punish millions of Afghans? When the Taliban was came, I got that women means like unhuman. This video shows the Taliban preparing to kill a woman who allegedly murdered her husband. Death is also the Taliban's penalty for lesser crimes like adultery or teaching girls. Here in Kabul's soccer stadium, the Taliban will publicly execute dozens of women. The future looks bleak for Afghans old enough to remember what Afghanistan was like before the Soviets, the Civil War, and now the Taliban. But in the small northern sliver of Afghanistan, not already under Taliban control, a resistance begins to form around Ahmed Shah Massoud. By the late 1990s, Mullah Mohammed Omar and the Taliban, his extremist Islamic regime, rule most of Afghanistan. The Taliban deliver on their promise to bring security to the country. But security comes at the cost of personal freedom. Under the Taliban's so-called Islamic regulations, it's a crime to wear fingernail polish, take a photograph, or invite a foreigner to your home for tea. Some of these laws are based on an ancient tribal code. Mullah Omar and most of the Taliban are Pashtuns, Afghanistan's largest ethnic group. But the Taliban encounters other tribes as it conquers new territory. These Afghans refuse to submit to Pashtun traditions. When people in Afghanistan realized or discovered the reality of Taliban, the resistance was getting power. Legendary commander Ahmed Shah Massoud leads the anti-Taliban resistance. When the Taliban took Kabul, Massoud retreated to the north and his birthplace, the Panjir Valley. Here, he forms the Northern Alliance, a partnership of the ethnic groups threatened by Taliban rule. Massoud is a Tajik. Afghanistan's other minority groups include the Uzbeks and the Hazaras. Afghan history is rife with tribal conflict between these groups and the Pashtuns. In the last three decades, we have fought against each other. Pashtuns killed, Tajiks, Tajiks killed, Pashtuns, Hazara killed, both of them. Nobody trusts nobody in Afghanistan. After taking Kabul in 1996, Mullah Omar sends his troops to crush the Northern Alliance and Afghanistan descends into vicious tribal war. Soldiers won't be the only casualties in this ethnic conflict. The Taliban also targets civilians. Omar's followers unleash a devastating new weapon, hunger. It's the winter of 1998 and the Taliban have closed off all viable roads into the Hindu Kush mountains. These roadblocks bar United Nations food convoys from reaching the homeland of the Hazaras, a tribe of Afghans thought to be descended from Genghis Khan's Mongol warriors. As temperatures dip below freezing, food shortages affect at least a million people. Starving Hazara children play a modified game of cops and robbers, in which they fantasize about ambushing a convoy of wheat and bringing it home to their hungry families. They call the game Taliban. The Hazaras were rebellious and uh, the Taliban were meeting resistance. So Afghans tend to be ruthless when it comes to taking revenge. Revenge factor which is in the Afghan blood. Important religious differences add to the bad blood. The Taliban are largely Sunni Muslims, while the Hazaras are mostly Shiites. Islam split into these two groups in the 7th century over a disagreement about who should succeed the prophet Muhammad. Traditional Muslims do not view Shiites as non-believers. 
They're recognized as being Muslims. They're within the Muslim community. But to the Taliban, the Hazara Shiites are infidels, or worse. What you're seeing is simply the application of an interpretation of Islam that makes Shia less than human beings. Now the Taliban embark on an ethnic cleansing campaign. This Hazara woman remembers the terrible day Taliban troops came to her province. When the Taliban came and took the houses, they martyred all the men. They killed them. My brother was 10 then. They beat him in the head with a cable so much that his nervous system got damaged. In Mazari Sharif, the Taliban kill at least 5,000 Hazaras, according to UN estimates. The only thing standing in the way of future Taliban massacres is Ahmed Shah Massoud. Civilian refugees soon flock to the protection of Massoud and the Northern Alliance. 400,000 people were displaced by Taliban. The only way to support these people was two helicopters that come under Massoud Hub. The helicopters were bringing breads from Tajikistan. As Massoud wins hearts and minds, he also begins to see some success on the battlefield. The Taliban have more men and better weapons, but few in Afghanistan can match Massoud's military mind. Fazal Ahmed al Manawi was a Northern Alliance commander. Ahmed Shah Massoud would fight using tactics and would gain a lot with a few casualties. He paralyzed the Taliban several times or caught them by surprise. With Massoud standing his ground against Mullah Omar, regional powers cast different bets on which group will control Afghanistan's future, the Northern Alliance or the Taliban. For Pakistan, the choice is simple. Generally, Taliban were Pakhtuns, and Pakistan has a geographic linkage and an ethnic linkage with the Pakhtuns. This Northern Alliance was supported by our enemies, basically Iran, India, and Russia. Now, what was the choice in Pakistan? The choice was being with supportive of Taliban. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates joined Pakistan as the only countries to recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. The Taliban also become a pet cause amongst Islamic militants, including the budding terrorist leader Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden and Omar have become fast friends during bin Laden's exile in Afghanistan. Today, former CIA officers reveal what American intelligence agencies knew about the growing connection between the two men. Bin Laden was helping Mullah Omar toughen his army in providing expertise to the Taliban about how to build highways, about how to run their economy, about how to improve agricultural production. One of the things I discovered when I went there was the extent to which the Taliban and bin Laden had more or less merged. With Mullah Omar's blessing, bin Laden opened several terrorist training camps around the Kandahar area. What bin Laden did for the Taliban is, in exchange for you know, the territory he held and all the hospitality that he was shown in his time in Afghanistan, he gave them men. The front lines of the Taliban's war against the Northern Alliance are soon teeming with holy warriors from around the globe the forerunner of bin Laden's terrorist army, al-Qaeda. Many are Pakistanis. According to former CIA officers, current Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf was responsible for sending scores of Pakistanis to fight alongside bin Laden and the Taliban. Musharraf wanted his troops to gain combat experience in Afghanistan before being deployed against India in the long-standing war over Kashmir. General Musharraf was instrumental in using uh, Afghanistan as a training ground for the guerrilla campaign in Kashmir. The freedom struggle in Kashmir, 17 years that goes on. We were killing each other on the border every day. Kashmir-bound Pakistanis, bin Laden's Arab fighters, and fresh recruits from the madrasas along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border combined to give the Taliban an enormous advantage over Massoud's northern alliance. 
Ahmad Shah Massoud was in constant trouble. He was a better tactician than any tactician they had on the other side, but he didn't have the manpower. The army of Islamic extremists arrayed against the Northern Alliance will soon prove dangerous to the entire world. These unabashedly anti-American groups continue to thrive in Afghanistan, even while their future target pays little attention. Even after the rise of bin Laden, the truth be told, you don't have a great deal of interest inside of the State Department or inside of the CIA or the Pentagon with Afghanistan. Soon, Osama bin Laden will give America a wake-up call. As the Taliban battle the Northern Alliance for control of Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden calls a press conference at his terrorist training camp in the southern Afghan province of Khost. In this video, bin Laden declares war on the United States, announcing that every Muslim has a sacred obligation to kill Americans. Bin Laden's announcement comes at a time when his Taliban hosts are struggling to earn international recognition. Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar phones a journalist at the press conference to express his surprise and displeasure with bin Laden. Rahi Mullah Yousafzai is one of the very few reporters who has interviewed both men. Mullah Omar called me from Kandahar and he asked me, was there some Taliban leader around when Mr. bin Laden was holding his press conference? I said, no, we didn't see any Taliban in that area. He was very angry, Mullah Omar said. Either I am the ruler of this country, or he is the ruler of this country. Omar demands that bin Laden publicly profess his loyalty to the Taliban. The statement said, I support the Taliban regime. I accept Mullah Omar as my leader, as the Amir al muminin the commander of the faithful. And I will obey all Taliban orders and policies. Bin Laden's oath of loyalty seems to end the friction with Mullah Omar. But it isn't long before Bin Laden causes new trouble for the Taliban. On August 20th, 1998, U.S. Tomahawk missiles slam into Bin Laden's terrorist training camp in Khost, the same location that hosted his declaration of war against America. The U.S. strike is in retaliation for the bombing of American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania just weeks before. The U.S. believes bin Laden is behind the attacks. America's retaliatory strike kills at least 21 of bin Laden's jihadists, or holy warriors. But the U.S.'s primary target is not among them. Where was bin Laden? Rahimullah Yousafzai had the opportunity to ask him directly. I asked him whether he was in the camp, and he said, I was 500 miles away. Speculation abounds that Hamid Ghul, the former head of the Pakistani intelligence service, tipped off bin Laden before the strike. When I retired from the army, uh, more than six and a half years before this happened, so how could I influence all this? If I had known this, I should have a mole in CIA. Do I have a mole in CIA? Go and ask them. Have they found that goal? Mullah Omar also has questions about U.S. intelligence. The Taliban leader can't believe that bin Laden could be capable of launching terrorist attacks from Afghanistan. The Taliban were so naive. They didn't know what was happening. When I told Mullah Omar that bin Laden has been accused of sponsoring these attacks on the U.S. embassies, he laughed. He said, how come this man who cannot meet anybody without my permission, who is under my protection in Kandahar. How come he can arrange these attacks? Outraged over America's allegations, Mullah Omar lashes out at the U.S. president personally. He calls Bill Clinton a liar and a man devoid of decency and honor, a pointed reference to the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Omar vows to protect bin Laden and says America itself is the biggest terrorist in the world. As if to drive home his defiance, Omar orders a new Taliban offensive on the Bamiyan Valley, 
home to two giant Buddha statues that have stood in Afghanistan for nearly 2,000 years. Amidst widespread international condemnation and anti-Taliban rallies all over the world, Omar's troops reduced these archaeological relics to rubble. It is just the latest in a series of moves isolating the Taliban from the international community. After the East African embassy bombings, Washington begins to realize that the Taliban and Osama bin Laden are inextricably linked. There was a belief that maybe perhaps the Taliban could be separated from bin Laden. I think that view was incorrect and it was pretty apparent by 1998. We know, for example, that even their main benefactor, the Saudis, went there and said, you should turn him over. And Mullah Omar said, you know, I only have one question for you. When did the Saudi royal family become the lackeys of the Americans? Saudi Arabia eventually withdraws financial support for the Taliban, leaving Pakistan as Mullah Omar's only remaining provider. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda uses its Afghan base to mount ever bolder terrorist operations. Bin Laden's followers attacked the USS Cole in October 2000. An Al-Qaeda recruitment tape surfaces a few months later, with Bin Laden promising more blood and destruction. Now, on September 9, 2001, the first stage of the most ambitious terrorist attack in history is underway. Just two days before September 11, 2001, a terrorist attack along the Afghanistan-Tajikistan border foreshadows the history-making violence to come. Two Arab journalists travel to the headquarters of the anti-Taliban resistance for a television interview with Northern Alliance leader Ahmed Shah Massoud. Massoud's friend, Fahim Dashti, hopes to get some good footage for the documentary he's making about Massoud's life. When I heard that the two Arabs went to interview Commander Masood. I took my camera and I went with them together. The Arab journalists carry a letter of recommendation, supposedly from London's Islamic Observation Center. But the letter is a fake. In fact, it was composed on a Kabul computer, frequently used by Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, second in command of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda. When Masood asks what the interview will be about, the so-called reporters answer, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and Osama bin Laden. Everyone who'd be happiest to see the Northern Alliance leader dead. Then the interview begins, and the reporters spring their deadly trap. I was busy with my camera. I heard the voice of explosion. A bomb hidden in the Arab reporter's camera instantly kills the cameraman and rips through the rest of the room. My eyes was closed, and I feel that I... I burn my hands, my face, my legs. Masood has also been hit. He and Fahim Dashti are both airlifted to a hospital in Tajikistan. But it's a week later before Dashti hears any news about the Northern Alliance commander. In that night, my brother came and said, just be beside me and told me that they were going to make a museum for chief. I said, what are you talking about? What is the necessity to make a museum for a life person? Then he did not say anything and he cried. And this was saying, this cry was saying me everything. And I feel that we lost the real leader for Afghanistan. Who ordered Massoud's murder? No one really knows for sure. But today, the former Taliban spokesman insists that Mullah Omar and the Taliban had no hand in the assassination. It was politic, and the Taliban denied that they were involved. And if the Taliban knows about it, they will not deny it, because Massoud was enemy of the Taliban, and they wanted to kill him. Taliban members allege that bin Laden and al-Qaeda acted alone. 
Killing Masood was bin Laden's way of repaying Mullah Omar for protecting him, says former Taliban Wahid Mosday. Osama thought he should do something, that if they killed Ahmad Shah Masood, then the war in Afghanistan would come to an end, and none of the Taliban would be able to say that Osama's presence here was of no benefit to them. In his last days, Massoud had traveled through Europe warning world leaders that the partnership of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban was a threat not just to Afghanistan, but the entire world. Now, it's too late. Al-Qaeda's deadly attacks on New York and Washington put Osama bin Laden and his Taliban protectors in the crosshairs of a deeply wounded superpower hungry for reprisal. On September 20th, 2001, U.S. President George Bush issues Mullah Omar an ultimatum. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Facing an impending American attack, the Taliban hold a high-level meeting to weigh their options. Mullah Zaif attends. I wanted to convince Mullah Muhammad Omar for some way of solution because I was confident that in Afghanistan will be destroyed, captured by America. Omar's closest confidants say the Taliban leader is completely unprepared to deal with the crisis. The Taliban did not know that bin Laden was planning these attacks. Mullah Muhammad Omar swear that he said I didn't know about September 11 and who was behind after that. Omar refuses to take the US allegations against bin Laden seriously until he has a chance to ask him about them himself. He said I called to Osama bin Laden and I met with him. I told him you are involved with that or not. Osama bin Laden uh, bin Laden Omar Osama said that he had not had a hand in the matter. He said the plan had not been made in Afghanistan and that what the U.S. was saying was not true. It was just to put pressure on the Taliban. Omar and bin Laden's relationship has been complicated from the beginning. They are strong allies, but bin Laden occasionally acts without the Taliban's knowledge or tacit permission. Still, Omar hesitates to turn over the Al-Qaeda leader to the United States without clear proof of his crimes. And Mullah Muhammad Omar said, uh, this is not suitable for us to do this kind of treatment with our brother. 